So what on our PowerPoints, we've used lots of pictures, and these are different pictures of ways that we have tried to engage all learners in preschool classrooms in science activities. I have done this in a couple ways. In the past, I've worked with um, a group from Kansas, Maryland, and Indiana, where we have worked to try to make an inclusive early childhood uh, curriculum, bringing a whole bunch of curriculums together. And one component of that was science. So you're going to see a lot of pictures where we try to work within these preschool classrooms and with families, with family projects, where we try to engage kids in different science activities, whether it was exploring things like snow, or making wind, um, experimenting with wind in different ways, or measuring, where you can see a little boy at home, he's measuring a counter at home. Um, so you'll see lots of pictures like that as well. What we really want to think about in this whole presentation is what does science learning and early education include? And what does that include for all kids? So we're going to think about the content of it, and then we're going to think about how we can make sure that all kids are engaging within it, Then we'll give some specific strategies. So again, we're going to talk about why it's important for young kids, what is science learning, including all kids, three classroom strategies from these practicing early educators, and then we want to also just hear from your expertise and hear what you guys are doing, and if there's different ways that you are finding success in integrating science into your classroom. All right. So here's some things, a little bit of background when we think about science. We know that young kids are curious about the world around them, and it gives us a really good opportunity then to engage them in scientific learning. We know kids like to explore things, figure out problems, examine things. I think about one of the projects that I'm working on right now is in an inclusive classroom that has um, toddlers in it, and it's both typically developing and kids that predominantly have language and speech delays or who are deaf and hard of hearing. And right now, are, we are working on implementing a science curriculum that integrates language um, and literacy along with science. And when I was there last Thursday, I think about we're, we're focusing on autumn, a good seasonal, seasonal topic. And so they went on a walk. We went on a neighborhood walk, and we collected autumn treasures. And so they were collecting bark and rocks and leaves and so forth, um, which lent itself wonderfully to different vocabulary. And then once they were back in the classroom, it was really easy to integrate scientific exploration because we were looking at the same and different. We were sorting the different treasures. We started talking about different animals that lived within these treasures because we were finding a lot of bugs on the autumn treasures that we were finding and trying to teach about gentleness too. That was a nice one, not squishing the spiders right away. Um, and it was just a really nice way of integrating scientific exploration within something that the kids were really engaged in. So we have a really cool opportunity then to, uh, to integrate science because kids have this curiosity um, about the things around them which is wonderful. We know that kids need lots of different ways to engage in learning. That spans all topics, including science. And we know that scientific learning at a young age can really promote positive attitudes towards learning, can help them as they continue to engage in scientific learning, and can help them span different content areas, like vocabulary, like literacy development, like math. Even the picture that I had of the child measuring, that's a pretty easy way of showing how math and science can go together, right? Um, so it's nice. This is another example of a kid where we uh, were sending home projects where they were really thinking about melting, um, and we were doing properties of matter. This was in a three and four year old classroom. And so we had, um, we were encouraging families to take an ice cube and bring it outside. It was during the summer. And then they could examine together with their kid what happened to the ice cube. We also know, so we have some, this is a nice evidence base for it, and at the end of the PowerPoint, there's a whole bunch of references, and some of these references have hyperlinks. So if you pull it up off the Edmodo page, you should be able to access these. We also have some nice support through different position papers that have come out, including one that just came out in April from the National Science Teacher Association and was um, developed in association with NAEYC. And this supports, um, this is adopted, a, they've adopted a position paper on the importance of scientific learning for young kids. And while they're specifically focused on three to five year olds, there's a lot of um, things that will uh, relate to kids that are younger. And then they also have a position paper that extends to age eight as well. So off the site, it's free and you can take a look at it. I also have the hyperlink that you can take a look at. It's really
position paper is based on the that kids are curious and they have the capacity to observe the world around them. And thus science really nicely fits in in a developmentally appropriate way into early education classrooms. It gives suggestions on what science can look like and about how early educators can support science. So things like valuing kids' curiosity and facilitating experiences that allow them to, um, to, do, to have, be curious, um, facilitate learning environments that build on daily science experiences by asking questions, making predictions and so forth, building upon naturally curiosity and intentional inquiry based so thinking about science not, doesn't need to be a standalone necessarily part in your schedule, that it can be something that is integrated throughout different content areas in an intentional way. So knowing that we have, there's an evidence base that's saying that young kids can, can engage in scientific exploration. We know that we've got some position papers that also give us grounds to do this. We can start thinking about what type of science is already present within the in your classrooms and how can we um, embellish this or make it more intentional within our classes. I think that we have such a great resource with the California Preschool Learning Foundations and they have just the most recent uh, volume, volume three, that is free to go online and download. So if you, if you follow that hyperlink, you'll be able to see the document where it really outlines the Preschool Learning Foundations for um, social sciences and science. Is anybody, has anybody taken a look at that a little bit? A bit. So you can kind of take a look. I'm going to just really briefly go through the four content areas, but I would encourage you to take a look because it is a wonderful resource that has tons of examples of what each of these different content areas are. And while I think that sometimes just seeing these, scientific inquiry, physical science, life science, earth sciences, looks maybe intimidating or unsure of what they actually can include, all of the different examples really show you that I'm guessing that a lot of us already do these within our classrooms. This just gives us kind of a grounds to be like, all right, I'm doing these three things. Here's another thing that I could do um, that um, would be really easy to integrate that I just have not thought about doing. In short, scientific inquiry is really the idea of making predictions, observations, documenting a process. So it's really kind of the heart of science when I think about it. It's not as much as, when I think about science, I think about it being so much more than just flip cards, right, to be like, what's a solid, what's a liquid? Those kind of things that would not be developmentally appropriate. Scientific inquiry is really the whole, getting kids to be able to um, somehow communicate this exploration, right? What do you think's gonna happen? Do you remember when we did this? What do you see in this? What do you think will happen? Okay, let's try it out. Oh, now what do we see actually occurring during this? So it's that kind of inquiry process where we're examining and exploring things. Physical sciences is looking at changes and characteristics of non-living things. So I think of an example of um, cooking, lots of cooking activities where you are pouring together, let's say making pancakes. So you're putting in a solid, maybe like a powder, then you're pouring in milk or you're pouring in water, a liquid. You're seeing what, what do these feel like, these substances? What happens when we put them together? If we put in a little bit of water, what happens? If we put in tons of water, what happens? How do we make it so that we can then pour it onto a pan? What happens when we heat it up? Why do we have to flip it? And that whole process, so examining things that are non-living and seeing what's happening with that. When I think about life sciences, I think about living things. So I think about a classic, I bet many people in preschool classrooms are planting seeds, right? So, and I have an example a little bit later on where you're planting something and everybody's watching it grow, right, in your classroom. That's a perfect example of life sciences where you are examining a seed, how does it grow, what do we need to do, why is it growing better in the sun, why is it not growing in the shade, whoa, we didn't water it, or we're likely maybe you're watering it too much if the kids are watering it a lot. Um, so thinking about that. And then when I think of earth sciences, I think about characteristics of the earth around us. So it's things like wind and soil and water and examining those kind of things um, and seeing, for example, if 
it's really windy. Why is it taking the kite really far away? Or can we make when we blow, what is that? What is that doing? If we blow softly, if we blow a lot, what can that do to a balloon? What can that do to paint, for example? Um, so thinking about those kind of things. Just to give you a little look at how much more detail there is, here's one example within the preschool learning foundations under physical sciences where you're examining non-living objects and materials. And you can see that they're trying to make, also get you to think about developmentally appropriate based on age. So you have examples for under 48 months of age and also 60 months of age. So you can see examples of what that might look like in terms of both properties and characteristics and changes within non-living things. So if you flip through it, it's a, it's a great document. The same goes for scientific inquiry, where it's getting you to really think about observation and, and investigation. And as, the, as our field is really grasping onto science or STEM, maybe some of you have seen stuff like that with science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEAM, we just really love acronyms. So now there's an A within STEM, where, which stands for the arts, which is really important. Um, and so with, with that really grasping, we're seeing more and more things being developed, including one, I have just included one cycle, which hopefully you can see a little bit, but you'll be able to see on the PowerPoint handout too, which really tries to take the scientific inquiry and make it into kind of an inquiry cycle. So thinking about how we reflect and ask questions, plan and predict, um, act and observe and then report and reflect. Really, that's kind of trying to grasp what this whole scientific inquiry process can be. So to put it kind of into practice more, I'm guessing many of us have done within our preschool classroom some kind of exploring paint, right? Whether it's finger paint or you've put paint down onto a piece of paper and you've had kids try and blow it or examine it, right? So pretty nice example of an art activity where you are um, where you're having kids maybe mix colors and so forth. But you can think about it also in terms of how this would be a really cool example of, of integrating science into an art activity. So you can have kids reflect and ask. So to be like, oh, first get them to, act, to, to think about other paint projects that they've done. And then to be like, okay, if we put two colors of paints on here, and then I give you a straw, what do you think you could do with it? And then get them to start talking about it. And then get, as they start thinking about things like, we could blow the paint to be like, well, if we blew it really hard and use lots of our breath, what will happen to the paint or the liquid? Could, if we make the paint touch each other, what could happen with that? Will the colors mix? If they mix, what colors do you think that they could make? Um, could, you make it could you make it go really fast, the paint? Could you make it slow? Is the paint thick? Is the paint um, thin or easy to blow, for example? So you can start talking about stuff like that. Then you can plan and predict. So maybe you make a prediction that if we all blow really hard on our paint, what will happen? Will it splatter? Will it run off the end of the piece of paper? What will happen to this liquid? So you start making predictions about it. Then you, of course, try. So then you get the fun part where you're actually trying it out, seeing what happens when you blow it. If you blow it softly, if you blow it um, uh, really hard, if you use a small straw, if you use a big straw, or what if we just don't use a straw and we just blow and what happens to the paint that way. So we're acting, we're observing, you're getting kids to talk about the process so we're observing again not is something that's not living so physical science we're observing what's happening and then finally we can talk about report and reflect on it so talk about it at the end a really important piece talk about what happened what did they try what happened when they blew all the colors together it just made a big brown mess or um, did it change? Did all of a sudden it change into a different color? What happened to what happened to it? And then to think about what else that they could do with paint, right? If we put more water into the paint, would it have been easier to, to blow the paint or not? And to think about stuff like that. So just in an activity that likely we probably all do, it'd be really easy to integrate science into that, into the whole inquiry process, right? Does that make anybody else think of things that they have done or ways that you have put the scientific inquiry process into activities? Keep thinking, keep thinking about it, maybe. I hope it, I really think about how easy it is to integrate this into activities likely that you're probably already doing, right, in, in your classroom to some extent. 
So when I think about what science learning should look like in preschool classrooms, I think about important things. I think about that it's a really awesome opportunity for it to be hands-on, that it can be interactive, it can be exploratory. So it's something that can really engage kids. Um, it has to be developmentally appropriate. So I loved in our keynote when he was talking about, you're thinking about the age of the kids and the preschool learning foundations help us think a little bit about what that could look like for two different age groups. It can be individualized to the kids' needs. Um, and you can think about how you can develop those skills, right? Um, it can include both intentional, so planning, but also spontaneous. When I think about the autumn example, I think about how this teacher had really planned out that she wanted kids to sort the different autumn, um, the different autumn treasures that they had found and that she really wanted to integrate some vocabulary into it. So not only the names of like bark and trees and, or leaves and stone, but she also wanted to talk about things like which one is bigger, which one's smaller, colors of the different autumn treasures. So she definitely had an intentional plan that she wanted to do, but it also opened up tons of spontaneous teaching opportunities where they could, start, all of a sudden they were talking about spiders more because there was a lot of spiders on it. Or they were talking about why, why were the leaves crumbling? And what happened to leaves cr when they crumble, if they go into the dirt? And, and starting to talk about that kind of stuff, how that could help the soil. So they were talking about that kind of stuff. Why did the leaves fall on the ground was a really big discussion. There was a little boy that was really concerned with this because they were falling from the trees and he was really concerned that the trees would be missing the leaves. So then he, there was like a nice discussion about how did the leaves fall? It's okay that they fall in the spring, what happens and so forth. Um, I think about it being integrated and embedded. So maybe it works within our schedules um, to have an actual science block, it might. Um, which could be really beneficial. But I also think about this as being something that can be integrated in an intentional way into different things, like the art activity, right? Um, and that it can easily be des designed to include all learners. So this is something, science is something that just really lends itself to getting all different kinds of learners, what, all different kinds of strengths and challenges involved into, into this, like many content areas. So just to talk a little bit about that before I pass it on to my three, um, our three teachers here, there is a really nice evidence base for the idea that early learning is, early science learning is vital for all kids, including kids that are at risk or di diagnosed with disabilities. And it, that it really lends itself to these interactive hands-on activities that can be supportive through uh, peer supports, peer models, and that it can support many different kinds of skills. Not only scientific learning, but socialization, language, um, working together, so that it can, be, it can be a really nice way of integrating different goals within two activities. There's some emerging research base on specifically learn, uh, integrating science into early ed programs and how, for example, one such curriculum that's called Literacy, or it used to be called Science Start, that it can, that it, when used, it can engage all types of learners um, and it can it improve knowledge base, language and literacy and science process skills of all types of learning learners, including kids that have disabilities or are at risk for disabilities. Is anybody familiar with that curriculum? Just sort of expensive. It's out of the University of Rochester and it's continuing to be developed, but it's kind of a nice one to take a look at. It's at the end of the references too. So just to get us thinking a little bit, and then I'm going to have the, the teachers just really share examples of how they do this. Maybe you have seen or have been familiar with the building blocks pyramid, which uh, Again, it's a, there's a reference at the end. So this is from a book called Building Blocks for, or hmm, Building Blocks for Preschoolers with Special Needs, and uh, really it gets us thinking about how we can integrate all kids within um, early ed settings, and it uses a triangle similar to perhaps if you are familiar with response to intervention, which is now more, is a little bit more K to 12, but it's, it uses a triangle model. And really it tries to get us thinking about how we can plan high quality 
early ed settings that include all different kinds of kids and how we can think about different kinds of kids needs within our curriculum and try and support their learning. So I want to use an example again that probably all of us have done, maybe if you were in an early ed setting, is planting seeds. So maybe you've had an activity where you've used beans or peas because they grow really fast. Um, maybe you've read books about planting, you've gone on walks and you've taken a look at different plants and you've talked about that whole process. Again, a really nice way of integrating tons of learning, including science. I listed on here a couple of the specific preschool learning foundations that this kind of an activity would address. So likely something that a lot of you do that is already fulfilling some of the, the framework um, that, that we're required in California to follow. So thinking about this kind of activity, let's take a little look at this triangle. So the first part at the bottom of the triangle is the idea that we are striving for high quality early ed classrooms. Independent of, uh, independent of the kids, we are striving for high quality early ed settings. So that includes all types of learners within it. Um, and so as part of that, that is thinking about on the slide when I, thought of, when I talked about how we are intentional about what we're teaching. It's developmentally appropriate. We're putting evidence-based practices within it. We're using the environment to support learning. We are thinking about a whole bunch of different kinds of content areas within our classrooms. So we're striving for this high quality. As a part of that, we can think about um, how science can be part of that, thinking about how there's the evidence base, we've got the preschool learning foundation or framework, we've got position papers to support that. And so as part of that, when we think about science, we can think about how are we going to integrate science into the, our classrooms in ways that um, in ways that engage all types of learners. So thinking about maybe some of you are familiar with UDL or Universal Design for Learning. Really, that gets at the point of thinking about how can we show information in a way that is, in a way, in many ways, so that is represented in different ways. So early ed is just beautiful at this. So likely, we don't just talk about plants like I'm talking about it. When you're with kids, you're showing them plants. You might have pictures of plants. You might have plants in your classroom. You might go on a walk to show them plants, right? You will model the plants, so you show them a seed. Everybody feels the seed. Everybody maybe takes a turn to put the seed into the soil. So many ways to represent this whole idea that seeds grow into plants and plants are important, right? So we have many ways. Maybe you show even a clip of a plant growing. You read books about plants. So many ways to represent the information. That's getting at lots of different learning styles, right? That is important for all kids, including kids with disabilities. Lots of different ways to represent the information. We also try and engage learners in many different ways. So all of those different ways, you're trying to get them excited, right? And in some ways, some of those kids are going to be really into the book, while others, they're going to learn the best while, you, while they're actually planting the, the seed, right? And that they're actually going to water their seed. So you're trying to engage them. Make it so that learning is meaningful to them and that they're part of the process. And then finally, you're going to also, as part of a high quality, you're going to try and get them to express their knowledge in different ways, right? So instead of just worksheets or something like that, maybe that's one way that you do it. But you are also going to get them to express their knowledge in other ways, whether it's just a thumbs up if they understand, or you're going to talk to the different kids, or you're going to allow them to use their peck symbols or different ways for them to show you that they understand. You're going to work maybe individually or small groups, or you're going to get them to draw a picture of what's happening to their seed, or you're going to um, sign with them, or you're going to get a translator to help them under, or understand what they're understanding. So you're trying to get a whole bunch of different ways that they can express their knowledge to you. So we've got a nice high quality. We're thinking about ways to represent the information, engage them, have them express their knowledge in different ways. Then the next part of the triangle is thinking about, I like to think of this as like little tweaks or modifications or adaptations that we need to think about in advance so that all of the kids in our classroom can participate in this. So if I think about the actual process of planting seeds, I think about the fact that, okay, I have two kids that really struggle with fine motor skills. 
So the actual process of them planting a seed might be tough because the bean seeds are small. So maybe I'm going to have it that I will have a peer help them or an adult help them or I'll get a different type of material where they can use tweezers or something where they can pick up the seed or I'll let them practice beforehand. Something where I'm thinking in my head, I want them to be part of this, I want them to plant the seed. How can I then make a tweak to ensure that they understand? Or I think about that maybe there's some kids when I say, you're gonna go over there, get the seed, bring it over here, put it into the soil and cover it up. That's a pretty complex three or four part direction. So there's some kids that maybe due to their receptive language or due to being dual language or due to behavior concerns, whatever it is, that's gonna be really tough for them to do. So I'm gonna think, okay, I'm gonna tweak this a little bit. I'm going to make a visual to be like, here's the, th here's the steps that we're gonna to use to plant the seed. And I'm gonna go through that and refer to it. So in hopes of having all of the kids be able to engage and independently go through this. So that would be one thing that I could do. I can think about how maybe some kids that the actual process is going to be tough for them. So I'm going to help them where I'm going to have their container already filled with soil for a couple of kids and that they are actually, and I maybe will even put the seed in the container for them and all I'm looking for is for them to cover it up. Or the little cups that I'm using, there's no way that this child might be able to, because of their motor development, be able to get their hand into there. So I'm going to use a pan, for example, for some of the seeds. So all different ways that you can tweak it. This list here is from the Building Blocks book and it gives you different ideas. So whether it's environmental supports that you can tweak, so making sure all kids can get to, for example, the, the seeds or can travel with maybe their wheelchair or their walkers, for example. Thinking about materials adaptation, maybe like things like tweezers or something to help them with the seed. Simplifying the activity, getting special equipment if I needed to. So maybe I, I program the board maker or the, um, their augmentative alternative communication device to help them be able to communicate as part of this. Peer and adult support, child preferences. Do you want this, the green seed or the yellow seed or do you want to plant the seed now or do you want to plant the seed after you look at the book for a few minutes? So giving them preference. Do you want to plant the seed by yourself or with your friend? and invisible supports. I think about that as I'm going to try and make it, I'm going to try and make this activity which is pretty fun and engaging, but I'm not going to do it when they're all hyped up necessarily. So I'm thinking about, I always think of invisible supports as like being a puppeteer in the background. So I'm thinking that after they're all, we've just read a book, we're all thinking about it, that might be a really good time to do something like this. Other than like they're really hyped up after recess or the playground. And I know that some of the kids are gonna have a harder time self-regulating after that. So I'm gonna try and pick a time that's really, that's really good. So invisible supports. So tweaks, that's what I think about. And then the last two parts of the triangle I think about specifically for kids that I have specific goals for. And that can be kids with disabilities. It could also just be, it could also be other kids as well. But I'm thinking about how can I embed learning opportunities within a, an activity that I want to do within my whole class that are specific to different kids. So maybe as I gave the example of the kid who might struggle with the four part directions, I might think about, okay, I have this kid, or maybe two or three kids, that I'm really working on two-step directions with their receptive language. So I am going to intentionally think about how can I use two-step directions and watch them and see if they're getting that. Or how can I support that? So maybe I say to, maybe I say specifically to a couple kids, can you go get the soil? and then bring it back here? Or can you get the soil and the shovel and bring it back here? And then I'm watching to see as part of maybe it's their IEP goal, their individualized education plan goal, or maybe it's a goal that I have personally that they're working on. And I look and I watch that. So I'm trying to purposefully embed learning opportunities within that. It could also be at the very top of the triangle, which well, I think about the triangles they're trying to show in perhaps in an inclusive setting that you're gonna be able to engage most of the learners at the bottom and then the, you're thinking about uh, being more specific for certain types of learners. And sometimes I think that is accurate. Sometimes I think in early ed, it could almost be a rectangle, right? Because there's a lot, we can think about all kids and their specific needs too, but that's why they have a triangle formation. At the very top, 
I think about individualization. So I think about that some kids during this process might need more support. So maybe that means, it, for example, in the classroom I'm working with with the toddlers, they have a speech and language um, pathologist that comes on um, to, on Tuesday and Wednesdays. And so to support some of this scientific learning, we have them in their, in their, their individual SLP uh, sessions. She's working on some of the vocabulary with small groups or individual. So we know that some of these kids are not going to be able to, just in one or two settings, for example, get the idea of bigger or smaller. And so she's really trying to work in collaboration to really think about how she can support that. And then they can come into the classroom with a bit more foundation with that. So I think about individualizing. So maybe that means that after you do the planting, that you can see that there's a couple kids that were really lost, or maybe they behaviorally, they were just having a tough time with it. So you think about, okay, I'm gonna try and pull this kid aside during center time, or I'm going to try and talk to this kid individually and really try and support some of these skills that we were doing there. Or this kind of activity requires a lot of collaboration uh, with a lot of different kids. So maybe it's an opportunity to, be, to then talk to the kid about engaging with peers or sharing or things that he could have said when somebody was bugging him for example. So maybe you can work on those kind of things. Sometimes I think of individualization as really coming out of the IEP goals or objectives. But again, maybe it's coming out of some other goals you have, like social emotional goals for a kid, that you can use a kind of activity like this to be like a springboard to really um, have a meaningful way to talk about different skills. Like, remember when Sabrina took your seat and you got really mad and you hit her? That, that was not a way that we show when we're frustrated. How could we have shown that? And then we can work with this child individually to think about it um, and from a meaningful situation that happened. So I think about this being even more usable when we think about actual examples that are being done in the field. So I'm going to have my... Um, my uh, early childhood special educators talk about three different things that they're using within their classroom to try and support inclusive scientific processes. So first, Laura is going to talk about how she's using peer-mediated support to support uh, science learning. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm here to talk about peer mediators, and um, I'm going to talk about the research behind it, and just a lot of it's coming from my own personal experience. I've been an inclusion teacher for six years, and I've used peer mediators in every classroom I've been in. Um, so I'm going to go over the definition and then strategies about how you use peer mediators in your classroom, how you can set them up, and and then also include science activities towards the end. Um, so the first is a definition, is that a peer-mediated support is simply utilizing peers to help children learn important objectives. Just like we're in our own community, we need support from other people, and just like our classroom is a community, children need support from peers and not just from the teachers. Um, so to be successful, children need many opportunities to interact with peers. This can include planned activities and within transitions throughout the day. So clean up, meal time, small group activities, circle time, just to name a few. There's always opportunities throughout the day to use a peer mediator. Um, and they all have like within the classroom, everyone's interacting with each other. So there's all these opportunities. Um, peer mediators can support a variety of different learning goals. It doesn't always have to specifically be their goals in their individualized education plan. It could be classroom goals. It could be individual goals that you're setting. It could be a goal that's just for the day if there's a behavior that shows up. Just always constantly thinking that it doesn't have to be the set goals that say service providers are giving or that you have decided for the classroom. Um, teachers play a crucial role in planning and supporting activities that will encourage peer media interactions. So we're the main facilitators, we're implementing things, and we're the support for the supporters, which are the peer mediators. So um, just to, there's some pictures at the bottom of activities that have been in my classroom. Um, one I want to share is the third one, is an art project. Um, and the little girl on the right, she didn't like coming to art projects. So thinking about a peer mediator for her was important to get her to transition to the art project to be encouraged. So creating an activity like a partner art project instead of having it be individual and everything being based on her, calling the peer over with a partner and having that peer actually go and say, hey, come on, let's go do this project together. We're partners or I want to do this. It helped bring her over and 
Ever since then, we always paired her with someone to come for art projects. So that's an example of using a peer mediator and kind of a planned peer mediator. Um, so the next is just strategies that teachers can use to pick peer mediators. Um, oftentimes, I think we feel that the student who is the most independent with the most skills will be the best peer mediator. That's not always the case. I always feel that the peer mediators have to form a relationship with that student. It can't just be someone who's a leader in the classroom. It could have a negative effect on the child unless they have that kind of relationship. So the first strategy I always say is to observe, observe, observe. I think we all do that within the classroom. We're always observing. And you kind of look at children's interactions and let them naturally occur within the classroom. So pick up on who has positive dynamics in the classroom, who's kind of you know, going towards and gravitating towards one student, um, and just looking for friendships. I think calling peer mediators, it's more of them forming a friendship and a relationship. Um, and I think like in our own lives, if a forced relationship is put upon us, it's not going to be as successful as if we seek it out ourselves. So just kind of observing what's happening within the classroom and what the students are doing themselves. Um, the next is to ensure that the peer feels confident independently doing the focus skill and how they can help someone else do it. You don't want them to think that the person or peer they're helping is a helpy. Um, so when I'm talking to the student, I'm not saying, okay, you're going to really help them today, and this is the steps, and we're going to make this plan. It's more knowing that they're confident in doing that, so they're just going to go about their day, and they're going to be able to help that, per that peer by maybe transitioning, like I said, just simply going and asking them to go get a peer. It's not describing them your plan of what you want them to do, what goal they're focusing on, just to know that that peer is going to be confident enough to do that for them. And to say a helpy, I think, I've personally run into students within my classroom, have looked at other students who are maybe below um, levels and had said, oh, they're the baby, or I'm going to take care of them. Then that goes into like more physical support where they're taking their hand and they're dragging them everywhere, where you don't really want that for a peer mediator. You want them to be on an equal um, playing field, basically. So the next is different peers can be used for different activities and our learning goals. Um, there's always opportunities throughout the day. I really like spontaneous peer mediators um, to kind of pick a peer mediator and decide that that peer mediator is only going to be the one peer mediator for the peer. It's not realistic for in the setting and different th parts of the day. So they can come up at any times. It could be that the student doesn't wash their hands and they find a peer that they want to stand in line with. And that peer is solely used just for that part of the day. And then maybe the next part, another peer is used. So constantly thinking about how peer mediators that we have planned are there, but also how peer mediators can um, turn up spontaneously. Um, the next is that the peer mediator needs to know that the teacher values their work. So giving praise and always just saying, you know, I really, I like to say, I like how you're being a good friend. Not, I like how you helped, help, help, help. Because then it does bring it back to, well, I'm a big helper and I'm helping this person who doesn't, you know, this child who can't do as much as I can do. It's still making them on an equal playing field and saying, you're being a good friend. Because that's really what it comes down to, I think. And I always say, you know, when you're addressing the group, hi, friends, and because we're all friends in the classroom. Um, so this example is one of my favorite examples of a peer mediator. Um, the little boy is the um, child who is the peer. And then the girl in the pink on the right is the peer mediator. And this was the process that started. Uh, this little boy has autism. and he was very hesitant to play with friends. He didn't know how to approach them. And I think that is you know, a huge thing that happens with children with autism is that they just don't know how to interact with peers. So we were outside, and he would always get stuck focusing on letters. And it was hard to pull him away. And meantime, all his friends were playing in the sandbox. And this little girl on the right was, you know, she was a leader in the group. And she was playing, and she was controlling the play, and letting her friends know the rules and what they were doing. And all of a sudden, he looks up, and he looks like he's curious about what they're doing. And I'm sitting down, and I'm observing the whole thing. I'm not going to get involved. I didn't want to push in when I, it wasn't necessary to. So he pulls a chair up, and then he keeps on pulling it closer and closer. And he keeps on looking. And then he finally stands up, and he kind of looks to the side of her so she can kind of see him within her field. And then she just kind of looks. And she's like, oh, hi. And then she goes about to her play. He sits back down in the chair again. And he did this about five times because he was so curious and he just didn't know what to do. And finally, she just looked and she's like, come sit down and do this. And from that moment on, he was happy as can be. And the next picture is later on within that day of him actually going into this car that we had outside. And he just followed her around because 
she knew what to do. He was, it was a model for him and he got it. And then he was included in play. And then without, throughout the whole school year, we utilized her. If it was circle time, for instance, on the picture all the way on the right, he didn't enjoy the calendar part of circle time after. It was after movement, it was hard for them to sit down. But if she was there, he would sit next to her. He would hold her hand. And as you can see, he's sitting in her lap. So this is a great example. And um, she's actually in first grade now, and he's in kindergarten. And they still are really, really good friends. And just to have that opportunity, he was having a hard time. His parents were very happy to hear that. They have play dates. And it's just great. And I've actually babysat them on their play dates. And just to see the difference of how he is by himself and then when she's around, I really don't have to do anything. It's just all observation. So it's a good um, example of really observing the whole time. I didn't prompt them. I didn't facilitate anything. I just let it naturally happen. I forgot that one. Do you want time? When did I start? Okay. <laughs> so the next is just strategies that you can use to support peer interactions within your classroom. So once the peer mediator is set up or selected, it's crucial to look at curriculum and activities in the classroom environment to ensure that these interactions will be successful in helping with the objectives. So the first is to arrange the classroom environment to support peer interactions. So have open spaces for communal play and cooperative play and encourage that kind of play. Um, a lot of the sites um, that I worked at, we've used the environmental rating scale and having different centers and having an, a free choice time where they can roam around freely, form their own groups. Um, and I think that's really important for, you know, picking peers and peer meters and finding those spontaneous ones throughout the day um, and not thinking solely one-on-one -on -one, teacher, student, I need to focus on this goal and it needs to just be a direct interaction with us. Goals can always constantly be embedded throughout the day. Um, the next is to create activities that children can do as partners or within a small group that includes a peer meter. So like the project that I did before with the partners, you know, having partner projects is really great um, to create something together that's meaningful for them, and it's all a part of the process and not the product. Um, and just, you know, thinking about when you're planning a small group project. So I often would write lists of names of kids, and if I saw a kid who had issues with a task at art or a project, or getting there for the transition, I would put that peer that I knew was gonna help them get there. So kind of thinking about that, maybe placing them sitting next to each other, or even if that peer is just used for the transition, then that's all they're used for. And then maybe they're fine with the task of the project. So just kind of thinking about that constantly. Oh, did you have a question? that uh, peer mediation might impinge too much on the other child that's being a peer. Like for instance, when you were talking about the young lady who was sitting in the circle time, mm -hmm. and she has the young boy on her lap, which is sweet and very loving, but at the same time, her time now is more focused on the little young person on her lap, as opposed to what's happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering at what point do you sort of see that maybe um, it could interfere with that other child's uh, development, individuation, et cetera, that could, um, where we might want to like, step in. I don't know. Um, it's just occurred to me. Um, no, that's a good point. I think that's why with peer mediators, you don't focus so much on the plan and letting them know, like, you're going to help, 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 help. It's just kind of letting it happen throughout the day. There's always going to be peers, regardless if they're just peer mediators or just forming relationships that are gonna sit near each other at circle always, or who are always gonna be next to each other, but they're kind of working together. And I mean, sitting down, yes, on the lap, we did stop that. I wanted to put that picture because I did think it was very cute. But um, most of the time it would happen where he would just sit next to her. So she was fully engaged, she was paying attention. There was never a point where we would always have to say, can you go get him and, and remove her from the situation. It was more just that she was sitting there and he noticed her in the group, and he wanted to sit next to her. So just kind of thinking that it's more natural than a planned process of really pulling that peer meter and kind of being like, OK, like you're going to do this, and just kind of forget about them. It's still just within the whole classroom of just you're running things the same way it always is. It just happens to be that that peer is going to help you. And it doesn't even have to be a direct Thing that you're saying to them, it can be totally indirect, and you could support it, but it doesn't have to be pulling them away. Does that make sense? Um, as a parent, I'm a parent in their 30s now, but it makes me think back on um, the fact that children, though, 
um, can sort of see themselves in that role as helper and sort of start to think, well, this is my place to um, to sort of support the whole group. And um, they can sort of get drawn into a situation where they do that instead of what they should be doing, which is their own individualization and their own development. And so I just, to me, I feel, I mean, that you have to be careful to make sure that the child doesn't somehow get drawn into it sort of as their own like self-congratulatory thing. And um, I don't know. No, and that's why I think it's important to pick peer mediators. So like, as I kind of use example, as you run into students who are like, oh, they're the baby, I need to help them. Thinking about that, they might not be the best peer mediator. So kind of if your example of worrying about that, then knowing that they might not be able to help or they might not be the best choice. And to kind of think about students who are just kind of not thinking that way and it's just like, well, I want my friend to come with me to this project and that's simple and that's it. So kind of knowing that if that's happening, then to kind of decide throughout the day or observe who can be another peer mediator that's gonna be um, more successful with a student. Yes. encourage everybody to help each other. Mm -hmm. There's just a whole classroom philosophy of helping. So it isn't even necessarily an experienced helper helping an inexperienced person. In the dress up room area, we have everybody trying to help each other with the clothes. So that since there's a whole philosophy around helping in general, those <coughs> children aren't targeted in any way. Even the helpers aren't targeted as helpers, and the, the children who need support aren't targeted as people who need support, because everyone needs help at different mm -hmm. times and we all have struggles so we just sort of mm -hmm. make it a very inclusive process in our classroom mm -hmm. and that way nobody gets overdone one way or the other. Yeah and that's why it's it's you it, the definition is like I think it kind of makes you think that it has to be so concrete that you're just picking one child it can happen all throughout the day. I mean, the example I had before of the little boy, he had multiple peers that were helping, and it doesn't always have to be where it's the typical child with a child with needs. It could be a child with needs with a child. It's it's anybody. It's always just thinking about relationships more than just I need this one person, this peer to help me with this peer. You know, it, it's throughout the whole day. So just thinking, and if you run into an issue where you think that that peer is not going to be a good peer mediator, you're not like firing them from the position. They probably won't even know any different. It's just all spontaneous, I think, throughout. Like you said, just having that community and thinking about who's supporting at different times, and it can happen anytime. Did that answer your question? Or Okay. All right, so moving, I think, um, oh, so, okay, okay, I'm going to go fast. So seek to plan highly engaging activities and incorporate high interest materials. Obviously, we all know that if there's nothing out that the child wants to play with, they're not going to play. They're not going to do anything. So having those motivating activities and high engaging activities out for them within the free choice area is great, especially if two children like it, having those moments of interaction as well. And then finding the balance between stepping back and supporting. So kind of what I've always talked about is observing always goes such a long way, letting it kind of the kids do it on their own. If I say it stepped into the situation of the story before, I could have ruined everything. And instead, I just observed, and it all just happened, and it was great. Um, so I'll go really fast with this example. This is an example of a highly motivating activity within a dramatic play area. The boy in um, the back, in the stripes, they're both in stripes, but the boy in, all the way in the back didn't like social play, didn't like dramatic play. We put out uh, masks from the story Mitten. We had been talking about it all week. He loved the sequencing. We had a felt board. We had the book. and then towards the last days of the curriculum unit, I put these in the play area. So as you can see the steps, he was kind of nervous, but then he noticed his friend was wearing the owl mask and he wanted to tell the story, went up to him, was very excited, sat down, organized all of them. Another little girl came and took the mask. Normally, he probably would have, you know, had a tantrum, had a negative behavior because he was organizing stuff, but then he was okay with it. And then we get to where he's wearing the mask, he's totally involved in the play, and that is kind of an example of spontaneous peer mediators. Those two kids never played with him before, but they're all in this common space area playing with the same things, and then that's what happened. Um, so, I'm almost done. So these are just some science activities to get into science. I know my other examples didn't really link to science, um, but just using the peer mediator strategies for science activities. So the first is scientific inquiry, and that's sink and float, 
like I said before, forming small groups, thinking about who's going to be in the groups together, charting out, asking questions, um, you know, having peers model what they're going to do in the activity, especially if you have a child with a tactile defense or sensory issues of maybe touching an object or putting it in the water. Them just sitting there engaging, getting joint attention, a peer mediator can help with that if they're just simply sitting down and paying attention. Um, the next is physical sciences, so um, an ice melting project, partner project, bring that child together, also with tactile defensiveness, touching the ice, you know, I would put out water and salt and ask the kids, you know, what's going to happen to the ice if you put salt and the water on it? And maybe the peer who doesn't like touching the ice can help put the water on. And then the peer who's helping them can touch the ice and pick out stuff. So kind of thinking about, you know, skill levels and what they're going to be able to do within the activity. Um, life sciences, obviously we all love butterflies. Um, keeping that in the classroom is really great for them to see constantly if maybe the peer wasn't interested in seeing it if their friend goes over, maybe they might be able to go see it. You know, just thinking about how to really get them involved and include them constantly. Um, the one on the right for life sciences is a project I really enjoy doing. It's a partner project. You see two of them putting paper underneath the table. And this was our um, ocean theme week. And I put, it was our coral reef dive. So you have snorkel gear, you have bathing suits, you put pictures of the fish and animals that live in the coral reef. And having that peer mediator come over to transition the child to maybe put on the clothes because some kids don't like to do that. And well, I'm putting on my bathing suit or, and they'll just follow, it's modeling. And then they dive in and they look up, which can also be something scary. It's unknown to go under the tables usually. So having that peer to help out um, was great. And then just earth sciences, that's dino eggs, coffee, um, dough, also a partner project in thinking about what kind of peers can help within that situation. Um, so yes, that's all about peer mediators. Okay. And then this is Lon. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lon Parti, and I am going to be talking about collaborative art projects. And this is something I'm very passionate about, and I love doing these, and it's always a lot of fun to find out what happens. Um, so I'm going to define what collaborative art projects are in um, the classroom where I teach. So um, they're extended projects in which all children can participate, learn, and create. So um, these art projects can help foster extended engagement. And it's great to see because sometimes children in the classroom don't want to do something or are hesitant to do something. And seeing a peer do something as a group can um, often promote you know, extending that activity. Um, it prom promotes teamwork. And it's really great to see when, for instance, in this first um, picture, the guys are all working to color a fire truck. And everybody decided to pick a little area and work together as a team. And it's an excellent way to get the children to communicate by, like, by modeling proper language, like, wow, that's a beautiful drawing you did, or that's a great wheel that you colored. Um, sometimes the children will you know, pick up on that. And it was really evident as the years progressed, you could see them picking up, you know, certain comments and referring to peers and talking about communication. And creativity, um, allowing the children to have their own, you know, voice in the project and to take something that has a theme and then to go with it individually and finding out their thoughts, individual thoughts and preferences. and. Some people really like green, and others like blue, and you, they get to go with that and figure it out. And the other thing, the one thing that I really love about this is the layering opportunities. Um, you know, you start with, you know, there's many layers to these projects where you, it, it extends in layers from, you know, painting and cutting and moving through um, different <laughs> things. And then my favorite uh, other thing is happy mistakes, where, um, for instance, we were painting a turkey, a giant turkey, for the Thanksgiving and um, November holidays. And we had paint brushes out and ready to paint the bird. And one little boy decided he was going to use his hands. And he dug his hands in the paint and just started painting his hands, 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 hands. And it turned out to be so beautiful because it looked like feathers. And I just kind of thought, wow, you thought of something that I didn't think of. And that's great. Um, and it just ended up being um, uh, really unique and really just 
great way for all the kids to kind of just jump in and do the same thing. And it wasn't planned, and it ended up being better than the original kind of idea that was planned. Um, these, project, these projects integrate um, classroom themes and also the preschool learning foundations, and they can be um, exploratory, you know, more open-ended, child-directed, or more facilitated, and um, they really can help children. Um, you can see the different goals and um, learning opportunities that a lot of these art projects can produce. So this is one of the um, projects that I was really great. And this is starting off with uh, some of the strategies for doing this. And generally choose an art project that's highly desired by the children working within the theme. And often, you know, you'll maybe start with a theme. And then, for instance, in this particular project, Dragon on the Doorstep just happened to be the big hit of the week. And it was just amazing how the children loved it. And that wasn't exactly what I had in plan for the day, but went with it and decided to do a dragon. And uh, they were really into it. So, um, you know, we just worked together to make a dragon and incorporated the different um, skills for that. And so the idea behind it, too, is that you um, aren't looking for a finished product, you're looking for a process. And when I was talking about layering, it's like a lot of these projects that are designed, they may go for a whole week. You know, we start with just painting and an outline. And then, so it's just painting, and it's more an open-ended thing with the children. And then we let that dry, and then we cut it out. And so they can see it, you know, layer and grow. And then, you know, it'll be maybe a shape matching idea. And then, so it just kind of fosters upon, you know, it layers upon itself over the days with different activities, but ending up in a whole. Um, and it's also a great way for children that have different abilities to partake. Um, often, sometimes the individual art projects are, you know, they're very small and they're very, you know, finite. And this is a, a great way for a child, for instance, in one of my class had, um, vision impairments where he could only see out of the left side of each eye. So designing a small art project with him was, you know, much more <laughs> difficult and it, it was more confining for him and having these large scale projects where he ate, was able to use the best of his abilities and had a fun time and a free time doing it, it was great to see and he really had a great time um, doing these, uh, these projects and then, um, also, it's um, for me. It's I find that I can incorporate um, all of the children's goals into different, um, di like in different times. So maybe a child has a cutting goal, so and then a painting goal or a matching goal or a shape goal, and so in all one project, you can incorporate all the different goals into one project and see um, what what they are able to do. And then often I will schedule each one of these kids into um, different, you know, centers. And so we rotate through different centers and small groups. It's not generally a large group activity. Uh, it's it's easier, and children get to see that they get what they're doing. And then maybe a child before them will help facilitate um, the activity. And um, it's very important to ta uh, talk and display. I after the project's done, we put it up and we talk about it, and they're really excited and really proud to see what they did hanging on the wall in front of them. And, um, and, and then you can also incorporate individual projects with that. Um, and then sometimes when the parents come in, by with doing this, when they're really proud of it, they tell their parents or they show their parents or their parents are what did you do today and it's hanging on the wall and it's it's a week's worth of work so it's having a parent see a child's week's worth of work is um, is really is nice to see um, so these are some of my favorite projects that I did um, this is incorporating we did a underwater water theme and with the oceans as well, and incorporating the science like sinking and floating and vehicles and animals. We created a week of oceans, ocean animals, and then a vehicle, 
which we created a submarine and I had all the children, you know, we painted the ocean and then added like the glitter and let that dry and then, you know, as individual animals identifying like octopuses, fish and having that be done in one day and then creating a submarine where each one of the children, um, each one of those circles were numbered and the child had to pick a number that they wanted to be. And so they, and then it was finding their own name, finding their picture, finding out who was next to them, who they wanted to be next to in the submarine. Also size discrimination, color discrimination, and um, you know, just a lot of different individual skills that they wanted to do. And it was, it ended up being a really, one of my favorite projects. One of the little boy in number five, he chose number five and he put his name and his picture in number five and then he chose five circles as you can see kind of on the bottom and then he it took me a while to figure out what he was doing with and then i realized them all he he is a hundred percent number five in this project and he is doing everything with five and it was it was it was really a breakthrough to see that and the, it just to see all the different you know kids and then at the end, when this was on the wall, it was really a great thing to see because sometimes art is so, you know, individual. It's each child is given a project to do exactly the same way, and with this, it's it's much more kinetic and free form. And then, as the more that I find that I do these projects, the more they say we. And for a, a early a preschooler, that's a, you know, that's a different difficult concept we we did this and they said that and one little boy said we made a submarine it goes underwater and it was just a really it that made my day it it was one of the most amazing things and the parent came in and was he both it was spanish and english were spoken at home and so the little boy went home and was trying to tell uh, the parent what he had made and the parent came in and he goes i don't understand what what you're doing in school something about He's he's underwater. He's he's hanging. He's underwater. And and <laughs> I said, oh no no, we made a submarine, and the, he he goes underwater in the submarine. And you know sometimes during circle time we'll set up a submarine and pretend we're underwater and play water music. And so to him he was underwater sometimes at school, and he was with all his friends. And you know he, him and his friends were hanging out underwater. Um, here's some more of examples of the different um, art projects that um, I've done in the class. Dealing with, you know, different, obviously different sciences. This is the life science and as Laura had mentioned, you know, she did a butterfly theme and we did too by, you know, having the butterfly go through all the different stages, the caterpillar to the chrysalis and then to the butterfly and um, this was bug, bug week. So it was focusing on bugs and you know, having this was it, and letting them see. You know, when this was done, the butterflies were just emerging. So, like the connection was really great, and they 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 really kind of got it, and it was it was great. And seeing them, like they get to choose their own colors. This was c working on areas because some of them can be more free form, and others, you know, y it there are some rules sometimes to art, and this was one of those. Pr yeah, and then the garden so you know incorporating you know planting and then bringing it in and having them be able to see it as art and then also in the outdoors so I'm gonna pass it off Thank you. hello um I'm Carolyn, and I'm going to be talking about um, inclusive outdoor play opportunities. So talking about how we use um, science in um, outside, which seems pretty easy and obvious, but sometimes you kind of take for granted being outside and that you can actually really plan and do a lot of things. Sometimes we just think, oh, good, we're finally outside. We're out of the classroom. I get to breathe for a second, but it's not really time for that. <laughs> Um, so to begin, I just want to talk about um, what my definition of outside play and inclusive play opportunities are. Um, then I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, 
how how I have set up and planned and organized my environment and this outside time to help encourage science and inclusion. Um, and then I'll give a couple examples. We're running a little behind, so sorry if I speak too quickly or skip things. Um, so uh, my definition is um, basically intentional opportunities to encourage meaningful play between children of all ability levels. Um, I have a couple little citations that, um, that I have. Sorry if it's a little too boring. I'll try to not take too long with them. Um, uh, an article by Jameson Fortson and Stanton Chapman in 2012 wrote an article in uh, titled, Encouraging Social Skill Development Through Play in Early Childhood Special Education Classrooms. Um, I really love this article. It talked about um, how um, it's important to use, as we've kind of talked all about, using um, peers to create a motivating and inviting and a meaningful play experience um, for all the children and increasing social proximity, um, peer help opportunities, if it's appropriate, and uh, using the buddy system, again, when that's appropriate. Uh, the article closes by addressing the importance of remaining mindful of adapting all of these ideas and strategies to, of course, suit each of the individual needs for all of our students. Um, then I talk about uh, children are not just sharing space. So we think sometimes, oh, just because, so I'm in a, an inclusion classroom, I have uh, seven children with IEPs on my caseload in my classroom, and then I have a co-teacher, the general education teacher, and um, we have 16 general education students. And some people think that just that alone, just those, those data points, just those facts equal inclusion, but there's a lot more planning um, and intentional intentional work that has to go into making it um, actually successful. So we're still working on that, but but it's it's going. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to skip to some important stuff. Um, another article that is called uh, Social Skills Interventions, not just for children with special needs, because I think we focus on that a lot. Um, but it's important to notice, as the discussion came up earlier, what, what about all the other kids? What about the general education kids? We can't forget about them or overlook them or use them too much. Um, all of these social skill interventions um, are really important for everybody in our early childhood settings. Um, and again, I just, it talks about just, just because you have these children with special needs in the classroom does not mean that these um, inclusion and these relationships are going to happen automatically. We as the um, supervising adults really need to be there to um, set up the peer modeling opportunities and really facilitate this development um, of real, actual, meaningful friendships. Um, also, outside play can include um, teacher facilitated um, as Alon was also talking about, some teacher facilitated activities, art activities, science activities, as well as, of course, child directed activities. Um, this can happen in large, a large group game or a special activity, which I like to do every day outside. We have a special activity as well as all of the regular things. Um, I'll talk about that later also. And then also sm small group activities and explorations. Um, their uh, positive way to support inclusion in all settings, including those with barriers for inclusive classroom activities. Um, some strategies for initiating inclusive outdoor play opportunities. Um, we meet collaboratively. Um, so this is how I'm talking about starting to set up for success, hopefully, for our outside playtimes and encouraging science. Um, meeting collaboratively with the other adults. I've been in a site where um, we had two classrooms sharing the outside space. So it was a really a big challenge to make sure that we were all on the same page and we were all trying to um, support science and learning and friendships all in the same way. Uh, now it's just, just our classroom so that's a little easier but still it's important to talk to, with the other the other teacher and the paras and make sure that everybody's on the same page um, talking about how brainstorming different ideas for activities everybody has favorite things to do outside everybody has favorite science experiments or um, large group activities so giving everybody a chance to talk about those and really plan what is going to be the most meaningful um, opportunities for the kids, and then creating a schedule. So I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, so 
there's another article, uh, La Rocco and Burns in 2013. Um, this is great. Actually, I think it was an assignment for Dr. Friesen's class. Um, it's not the what, it's the how. Four key behaviors for authentic leaderships in early intervention. So it talks about four different ways of being a leader in our position. Um, I like to focus on modeling behaviors, which we all know we do that for our kids, but it also works for adults as well. Um, if you have an idea of what you want an activity to look like outside, or how you want supervision to look like outside, it's great to just model it. And often ad other adults will notice, oh, that's really working with that child. I'm going to try that next time. I'm having that issue. Um, so really modeling the way you want things to, th things to look like. Um, um, so some um, important learning objectives and individualized goals you may want to support outside um, that goes with science and as well as, as we have talked about, crossing over with other, other um, domains. Um, for example, sharing, turn-taking, acceptance, kindness, patience, teamwork, communication, and community building. Um, in my experience, really, it's, it's often that um, I've worked with a lot of students that Really, they, they tend to be very open and want to play with each other, no matter what other kids' developmental abilities or challenges are. But it's when adults don't know how to support that inclusive um, relationship. That, and we, we might reflect some negative thoughts, even if it's out of a good place, like, oh, no, so-and-so can't, can't ride a bike, so why don't you play with somebody else? Instead of saying they can't do that or they can't do this, um, trying to think about how, how to get, if somebody wants to play with somebody, how can we, how can we make that work? Um, so let's see, where am I? Uh, consider how the environment um, can be set up to support inclusive play. This could uh, include social proximity, as we talked about, uh, peer help and zoning, which I'm going to talk about next, um, and or utilizing a buddy system, which is kind of like the, the peer help. Um, so zoning, or the zone defense uh, schedule, or the ZDS, is a way to organize uh, the roles of the adults inside the classroom or outside. Um, the ZDS, actually, the zone defense was borrowed from basketball, I read, and uh, which they talked about how the players, um, it's a way to organize and describe how the players on the court are responsible for what areas um, to do whatever basketball people do. But um, <laughs> it, it, for me, it just makes a lot more sense for being outside. Uh, so you can, um, this picture in the middle here, the scheduling and zoning, the picture in the middle is actually a little bird's eye view of a classroom, but you can do the same thing for outside play as well. So I drew up, um, but I didn't know how to, <laughs> to, to, I guess, scan it. Um, I'm not very technology savvy. Um, so you can draw a picture, doesn't have to be fancy, just draw a picture of your outside space or your inside space because it works everywhere. Um, and just come up with the zones. Once you draw it, it kind of makes sense. You already know what your zones are, but just to use the language, it just sometimes works for, for some people, and that way all the adults, whoever's going to be in the classroom, um, your regular adults and then the specialized uh, people who come in once in a while, if everybody knows what zone is what, then everybody knows where they're going to be or where, where whatever activity is going to be happening. Um, so to go along with that, I have the staff schedule um, where I just have, so everyday activities, there's just ideas, and they're all um, according to the zones, and I have people sign up, and you can write which activity you're going to do. You could do it weekly or daily, um, but then it's, I also like to do a special activity. My special activities, I like to have one different activity a day. Um, either the activity is usually a science-based or a music and movement-based activity. I like to do all those things outside. Um, so then somebody always knows what they're going to be doing, and you don't have clumping with adults, people thinking that it's time to take a break or chat, and everybody is supervised and the engagement is facilitated and play is happening and science learning is happening. Um, and so that is posted in the classroom. We sign up. And then um, my other sign over here is just a little, um, this was our brainstorming ideas of how, um, what are great activities to do um, outside, um, sciencey things and otherwise. So there's just regular things. It's a little, I think I need new glasses, but um, 
there's <laughs> regular things, um, you know, of course, the sandbox and bubbles and bicycles, but then more science related things like a water table. Um, even if you don't have a water table, you can have buckets and do water table or water buckets on the ground. Um, I also really like to use blocks outside. Blocks are not just for inside, we can do blocks outside and um, really experiment with um, my picture before. This, um, we were, the kids were making um, a roly-poly castle, they said. Um, our yard has a lot of roly-polies. We live um, in the city up on Twin Peaks, and our school, well, our school lives there. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of bugs. So um, we started bug hunts, and then they wanted to make a home for the roly-polies. But then more kids wanted to make the home for the roly-polies, so the home got bigger and turned into a castle. Um, and so we were able to experiment with um, physical sciences with the blocks and uh, the size of the blocks and the weight of the blocks and they started bringing in pieces of of bark and and some garbage because um, it's a windy city and there's garbage everywhere but um, pine cones and all kinds of things and figuring out what what could balance where and what the really pulleys would like to crawl on and um, what was going to be their food um, and so that that turned into a great science activity and then ever since then we've just left the blocks outside um, and the blocks are utilized every day uh, this is a picture of the a parachute i'll talk about that activity later those are my kids from last year i missed them um, and so back to this one um, so using i'm just going to close with the the zoning um, just i think using just the simple zoning organizing maybe other people have great ways of organizing your outside play but i have just found that this works and it really just helps to kind of alleviate some of the challenges and the chaos that outside play and science can be um, and it just really helps to create a successful learning experience for all the kids um, so my last slide like three minutes um, is out so this is a bunch of my pictures of um, our outside play um, uh, the first things that are up here I have a couple other examples as well but I kind of talked about bug hunts and nature walks um, this is uh, one of my little girls showing showing me she has like a handful of roly-polies um, that otherwise she really she really doesn't like to get dirty or messy or like yucky things but for some reason because all of the kids were really into this bug hunting um, she she decided to be excited about it as well so that was great um, and then the picture with the little helmet and the two little boys up there that's the same thing we're doing more bug hunting and then uh, the picture on the bottom we're doing a little a little nature walk looks a little sad with that chain link fence but that's school in the city <laughs> um, but so so I just wanted to talk about Dr. Friesen talked about the um, the scientific inquiry cycle and so I was just going to do a little example of what um, for our bug hunt what that looks like using those um, so the first one is reflect and ask so the kids this is how this the bug hunt came about the kids were whoa like on the first day of school whoa why are there so many bugs what are all of these these are yucky why are there so many um, the plan and predict was can we find more I'm gonna find a lot so that kind of became a competition, but also guessing how many they could find. Um, then the act and observe. We used uh, bug nets, little bug boxes, uh, magnifying glasses. Um, when we ran out of things, plastic bags, little Dixie cups um, to collect and then observe and study the bugs. Um, and then report and reflect. Um, this is kind of one of the kids said this is kind of like a, a daddy one because it was really big and so we talked about the size and this is like a little baby one because that was very small and this one is very black and this one is kind of like grayish um, so we were able to uh, talk about all of those properties um, colors senses shapes sights weights all of those things so in outside play all of these experiences and examples we have life science physical science scientific <laughs> inquiry uh, earth science with our nature walks as dr friesen talked about the neighborhood walks or nature walks um, and i'll just quickly finish with um, as we talked about in the preschool foundations the science foundations are are pretty broad um, but they are really helpful and just going over them really will help um, you come up with ideas that's 
that's how it, it helped me come up with ideas. And also just really paying attention to, to your students and their needs and their interests. And that's where I like to go with because that's how they get motivated and want to be involved. A final note, um, it doesn't have to be, as we've talked about, just about science. It can, uh, you can definitely integrate other content areas. Interconnecting these content areas and developmental domains um, will really help create a more meaningful and concrete learning experience for all of our little scientists.